So this talk is about Event Machine. Um, I'm going to cover a lot of code, uh, a lot of different stuff. So if you have questions at any point, feel free to ask. Um, if something's unclear, just interrupt me and uh, let me know. So about me, my name is Amon. I live in San Francisco. I've been maintaining Event Machine for 18 months now. Uh, I was responsible for the last four releases. Uh, there's another release coming up in probably the next two weeks. Uh, I work on a bunch of other projects. Um, Mostly, lately, it's been performance and debugging stuff for MRI. Uh, and you can follow me on GitHub and Twitter. So what is Event Machine? Uh, I'm curious, how many people have heard of Event Machine? And how many of those people have actually used Event Machine? OK. Um, so Event Machine is an implementation of the reactor pattern. Uh, it's similar to Python's Twisted project. Um, Event Machine currently supports a bunch of Ruby VMs, uh, including 1819 and Rubinius, uh, and all three of these use the C++ reactor. We also support JRuby, which has its own Java reactor. Uh, in addition, we have a simple pure Ruby version of the reactor uh, that kind of sort of works. Uh, not many people use it, and it doesn't have all the features that the other reactors do. Uh, so who uses Event Machine? Uh, a lot of people use Event Machine. Uh, it's in heavy production use in hundreds, if not thousands, of reactors. Um, it's um, definitely production tested, very stable, and uh, if you're trying to do some of the things we're about to talk about, um, event machine is definitely something you should look at. So this talk is about I.O. Uh, what is I.O.? I.O. Uh, for us usually refers to network I.O. So this includes basically talking to network services like MySQL, HP, Memcache, stuff like that. And in the context of web applications, most web applications are I.O. bound. They are not CPU bound. It's not common that you were writing a uh, Ruby web application that is generating fractals, although we did see that today. Um, so the basic idea behind EM is that instead of waiting for I.O., instead of waiting for MySQL response, or instead of waiting for some data to be returned from an HTTP request you made, you can use that time to do other stuff. Uh, and we're going to dig into this a little bit more. So uh, that's basically what EM is really good at. It's really good at scaling I.O. heavy applications. And EM can easily, in production, handle five to 10,000 concurrent connections with just one single Ruby process. Um, and this applies to really any type of network I.O. Uh, you could be sending emails, making HTTP requests. You can even write your own custom TCP proxies. People have done that, written proxies in front of MySQL or Memcache. Uh, and you can, uh, a lot of times, people will use it to do data access, since data access usually ends up being uh, pretty slow when you're doing expensive queries against MySQL, for instance. So let's just talk about how uh, you do I.O. in Ruby uh, with that event machine. There's a bunch of APIs. There's TCP socket and server, which uh, is kind of expected. So here's actually the class hierarchy of what, uh, what the I.O. classes look like in Ruby. In this. Uh, and you'll notice in here there's a class socket that's actually not the super class of TCP socket. It's actually just its own little thing. It's kind of weird. And it's actually should probably be called raw socket or something. But it, that provides a raw access to the BSD socket API. That's something that you would be using if you were writing C code to do these similar sort of things. Um, you could take C code and translate it directly to the socket API. Uh, and that's what code usually looks like when you do this. Uh, and you'll see there's a lot of code. You're creating a socket, but you're also creating a socket address. And you have to tell the socket to connect to that address. This is not something you would usually do. But if you were writing C code, that's pretty much what it would look like. So using uh, the higher level APIs, say you wanted to write a very simple TCP server. Uh, you can do this pretty simply in a few lines of code. So you start up a TCP server that's an object. And you can accept new connections off of that socket. Uh, and so basically, anytime somebody connects, uh, except it's going to return that new client. And then that client is its own TCP socket that you can use to read and write data from that client. Um, an important thing to notice here is that anytime you call a read function or even a write function on a socket, it's going to be a blocking call. And so what this means in this context over here is that you can only handle one client at a time. Because you're sitting here, uh, if you see the code calling client.readline, and until that client sends you a line, you're basically going to be sitting there just waiting. And even if someone else starts to connect, they're going to be unable to connect. So a common solution to this problem is to use a thread per client. And it's pretty easy to make that change. You just wrap the server accept in a thread. And so every new client that comes in, you spawn off a thread for. 
Uh, this is cool, but it's not really a great way to scale. Uh, and what we're going to talk about is basically the alternative to doing this, which is non-blocking I.O. So this is the alternative to having threads for each client. Uh, and basic, the basic idea is instead of blocking, you know, instead of waiting in the read call, you just never block. Uh, and you can notice that this non-blocking version is way longer. It's way more complex. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on. I'm going to point out a couple things. Uh, first of all, you have to keep a list of clients. Um, there's a whole bunch of buffering going on. Um, and so basically, the way this works is you have a list of clients, and you pass this list into an API called io.select. And io.select will basically watch those clients and when some of them become readable or writable, return to you an array of ones that are readable and an array of ones that are writable. And then once it's returned, you can basically loop over those and process them as you want. Uh, you'll also notice, uh, it's probably pretty hard to read, but uh, instead of calling read or read line, we're calling read non-block. So there's non-blocking versions of all these API functions. And that basically returns whatever is available. So maybe nothing is available. Maybe we're passing in a 1024 is max size, but maybe only one byte was available. Whatever is available, you're going to get returned. And so what this means is you actually have to do some buffering. So if in our previous example we were waiting on a line, you can't, uh, you don't know how much data you're going to get. So you have to make sure you actually got a full line before processing it. So this is what EM does. EM does non-blocking I/O, and it basically takes. This is the exact same thing. It's just the EM version of it, and it takes care of all that sort of boilerplate, low-level stuff for you. So you don't have to worry about it. The code that you write is basically the code that handles, uh, in this case, parsing out a line and responding. So uh, EM does a lot of other stuff behind the scenes that basically manages all those inbound and outbound buffers for maximal throughput. Uh, it does efficient I.O. with those buffers using some syscalls if they're available. And it has EPOL and KQ support, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So you might be wondering, what, what is a reactor? Uh, and this is something that trips up people a lot. Um, so a reactor, very simply put, is just a single-threaded while loop. And that's all it is. And it's commonly referred to as a reactor loop. Uh, and so here's some Ruby pseudocode that would describe you know, a very simple reactor. As long as the reactor is running, you just keep iterating. And uh, this reactor has timers. So if there's expired timers, you go ahead and process them. If there's any new network I.O., you go ahead and process that. So the whole point here is that your code, the code that you are writing, is simply reacting to incoming events. That's why it's a reactor. Uh, and an important thing to notice here is that if, if you write some code in your event handler that takes too long, that's going to impact when other events fire. Because the longer you take, the longer other events have to wait to be able to process. So the big lesson here, and this is something we're going to come back to over and over again, is that when you're in a reactor-based system, you can never block the reactor. And so what this means is a lot of common APIs that you might be used to as a Ruby developer, you cannot use. So you can't sleep. If, for instance, you start sleeping within while loop, it's going to block that loop, and nothing else inside that loop can happen. Uh, similarly, if you're doing a lot of work, like batched up work, if you're trying to iterate over something that's 100,000 items, that's something that's going to block and not allow other things to happen. Uh, blocking I.O. and polling, similar sort of things. MySQL queries, for instance, can take a long amount of time. And if you're waiting on a five-second query, that means there's five seconds that no one can connect to your server and do other stuff that they need to. So. Um, uh, just, just to demonstrate that point again, like you're inside of a reactor loop, and then if within that loop in your processing code you start up your own while loop, uh, that just means like the outer loop is essentially blocked and nothing else can happen. So uh, reactor events are handled asynchronously, and this is something you'll hear a lot when you're talking about a event machine or reactor-based system is this word asynchronous. Uh, so I just want to sort of make a distinction and show what asynchronous Ruby code looks like versus what code that you're normally used to writing looks like. So synchronous co Ruby code uses return values. And this is something ver that's very uh, sort of natural to us as Ruby developers. Uh, you call a function, it returns a value, you do something with that value. Asynchronous evented code cannot use return values. And so the way this works in Event Machine is you use Ruby blocks. And instead of getting a return value, you pass in a block. And at some point later in the future, that block is going to get invoked with that return value. And this is actually different from the way that you might be used to using blocks. Uh, on the left is 
whenever you do uh, looping or using numeral, you pass in the block, and you're sort of used to you pass in the block, the block is going to get invoked a few times, and then code after that block is going to get invoked. But when you're dealing with asynchronous code, the block that you pass in is not invoked right away. It's sort of stored. It's, um, it's going to get invoked later when the return value is actually available, and you don't know when that's going to happen. So um, it's just something to keep in mind. We're going to cover that in more detail. So uh, uh, react, you're reacting to events, and events are actually really simple. You know, Instead of waiting for something to happen, like we said, and um, basically waiting and then running some code, you take that code that you're expecting to run, put it inside a proc, and then whenever that event triggers, whenever you're ready to do that, you invoke the proc. So again, just to, just to show off the code, uh, say you have a queue and you're basically waiting for something to show up on that queue, one way you might implement that in a blocking synchronous style is you're just going to sleep until the queue has something in it, and as soon as the queue has something in it, you go ahead and use it. The way you would write that as an event is to use, put the code that's using the queue value inside a proc and basically make that an event. And so you're saying as soon as someone pushes something onto the queue, that's when I want my proc to run. And so in this case, you're no longer blocking. That's just going to, it's sort of an event. It's going to happen whenever it's going to happen. And instead of doing a sleep and just sitting there, you can let other things happen at the same time. Uh, the problem with events, events as a concept are pretty simple, but evented code can get pretty hard. Um, the problem is, so we take the code on the left, it's doing three things in a row. It's getting a URL out of database, making an HTTP request using that URL, getting a response, firing off an email using that response, and then printing something out. When you rewrite that to the evented sort of asynchronous style, you end up with these nested blocks. And these can get really hard to parse. Um, another thing you might notice is we can no longer use exceptions. So we can't just use begin rescue. We have to do more work. We either have to pass in an extra block that's an error handler, or we have to pass in an extra field uh, to each of these blocks that's sort of a success or failure case. So there's sort of trade-offs either way, and it's up to you as a developer to sort of understand your choices and make the choice that fits best with your application. And you know the three things are maybe you just actually don't need to scale, uh, and you're not expecting much traffic, and your code is just fine, uh, written the way it is on the top there. Uh, there's a sort of a middle ground where you could write code like that and scale using sort of a unicorn style model where you fork off multiple processes and you have a centralized queue. Um, or and there's certain cases where you actually need to, the best thing to do is to rewrite all your code to be asynchronous so you can actually achieve really high levels of scale. Uh, there's also another solution um, using Event Machine with threads. Uh, this is also sort of the best of both worlds. You can run code that is blocks inside threads and run all your async code inside the reactor. Um, in the past, this has caused issues, but most of these issues have been fixed. We're going to come back to this. But overall, threading is not really the best way to do things. I mean, it works. It definitely does work. But it's still an unnecessary amount of overhead that you're uh, introducing, you know, per client, for instance, if you were following the example we showed off earlier. So, how do you use Event Machine? Event Machine is just a gem, like I said, it works. Uh, you could even do this on Ravinius or JRuby. So, all you have to do is gem install and require it, and you can use it. And Event Machine has a lot, a lot, a lot of different APIs. Um, I'm going to breeze through a lot of these, but I don't want I don't want you guys to get caught up in the details. I'm going to show off a lot of code and stuff, and these slides are up. They're already up on time to bleed. If you want to go back as a reference, they're actually going to be pretty useful, I feel. But the thing to keep in mind, and the thing I want you to take away, is just watch for common patterns. I'm going to point out certain things that show up over and over again. And there's certain things that we do over and over again. They're usually to prevent blocking the reactor. And so you'll see the same patterns. And just look at these code samples and just compare them to the way that you would write blocking code, the way that you're used to writing code, and just sort of uh, do compare and contrast and say, you know, this is the way I'm used to writing code, but this is the way that I would have to write code if I were to make it asynchronous. So, uh, first off, how do you run the reactor? Uh, there's a simple API, eventmachine.run. Uh, it just starts up that while loop. It takes a block, and as soon as the loop's up and running, it's going to invoke that block. Uh, the thing to keep in mind here is it is a while loop, and so if you have code after the while loop, it's not going to run it's basically going to take over your Ruby process. And so you basically hand over your Ruby process to the reactor, and the reactor 
uh, fires, events, and then you handle those events and return control as fast as possible back to the reactor. Uh, so basically, in this example, the puts at the bottom there is never going to happen. Uh, there's another simple API. You can check if the reactor is running or not. And finally, you can stop the reactor. So in this case, as soon as we stop the reactor, then it's going to continue execution that puts finally actually will happen. So like we said, uh, the reactor is basically just a while loop, and there's iterations of this while loop happening. And so there's a few different APIs to basically manage and deal with iterations inside the reactor. And the most powerful one of these is called em.nexttick. And basically what this does is queue up a proc. So you pass in a block or a proc, and it basically makes sure that code will get executed on the next iteration of the reactor loop. So again, we go back to this very basic rule, do not block the reactor. So what this means is if you're trying to do a lot of work, you need to split that work up into small chunks and basically do it across multiple iterations of the reactor. So there's a common pattern that uh, you'll see a couple times and all over EM's code base. It's sort of a recursive. It's not really recursive, but it's a proc that schedules itself to be called in the future. So a really quick code example on the left, we're doing a very simple sort of synchronous loop where we process a thousand things. We call it do something a thousand times. If you rewrite this to be asynchronous, basically you create a proc that does one chunk of work. So it handles, it calls do something once. And as soon as it's called do something, it's going to schedule that proc to happen on the next tick again. And so you create this proc, and it's going to schedule itself after it's done, and then you just have to kick it off once. So you say em.nexttick do work once, that's going to start it off. It's going to do a piece of work and schedule itself over and over again as long as it needs to. So that's a common pattern. Uh, there's a simple wrapper around this. Uh, something to keep in mind, this is not something you use very often because iterations happen very, very frequently. So on this laptop, for instance, you probably will hit 30,000 iterations a second. And there's not a lot of code that you actually want to be running 30,000 times a second. If you run any significant amount of Ruby code that, that often, it's just going to peg your CPU. Uh, mostly, this is useful for integrating with other reactor loops, um, which people sometimes need to do. Uh, the tick loop is just a nicer way of doing it, and it gives you a few nice APIs, like you can pass in another block at the end, and that just gets invoked when the tick loop stops. You can also call stop manually externally on that tick loop. Uh, this is something that you would probably end up using more often if you're trying to do this kind of work. Uh, this is an iterator API inside Event Machine. So it provides a bunch of stuff. So let me just walk through, again, comparing and contrasting synchronous code versus asynchronous code. So when you're iterating synchronously, this is the way you usually write code. Uh, you pass in a block, the block executes, and as soon as the block is done executing, it moves on to the next iteration and uh, invokes the block again. The problem is when you're writing asynchronous code, you can't do this. And the reason is because you don't know that when the block ended, the work that you were trying to do is actually over. And so all EM iterator does is basically just pass in an extra object, and you have to manually explicitly signal the next iteration. Uh, so here's a simple example. Like We're iterating over a bunch of numbers, and by the time that block ends, the outer block that's iterating, you're not actually done because you're still expecting to wait an extra second before. And you know the add timer is just sort of, uh, we're going to go into timers in a little bit, but it's basically doing some work, and a, a, a second later, it's going to fire something off. And so when that outer block finishes executing, you're not actually done. And so you have to have a way to explicitly say, I'm done, move on, do something else. The other really cool thing in here is that it takes a second argument, and that's basically the concurrency you want. And so. Uh, this is a contrived example, but maybe you're passing in a list of URLs and you want a concurrency of 10. You're basically saying, do 10 HTTP requests at a time, and any time one of those requests finishes, signal the next iteration. So it's going to pick another one off the queue and do it. And so you're doing 10 things at a time. Uh, we touched on threading briefly. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to breeze through these slides. Uh, you can look back through them if you're trying to do uh, mixed threads in EM. But basically, you can run Event Machine in an external thread, and there's this common trick that you use uh, that basically pauses the current thread until the reactor is up and running. Um, there's EM Schedule, which is a simple wrapper around NextTick, but it's basically a way to ensure thread safety. And uh, so you can either run Event Machine itself in a thread, or you can run your own code inside a thread pool that Event Machine provides. Uh, so by default, Event Machine does not use threads. And if you want, 
to use threads, you have to invoke this special API, em.defer. And the way this works is you basically, again, pass in a proc, and it's going to do, instead of doing that work in the main loop, it's going to do it in a thread pool. And you can set the size of this thread pool. So timers. Um, again, back to this very basic rule, don't block the reactor. So uh, obviously, you can't sleep, and there's plenty of times that you need to basically wait some amount of time. And so Event Machine provides different types of timers. Uh, there's two basic types of timers. There's single one-shot timers, and there's periodic timers. Uh, so the way this works, again, is you can just create an object uh, that represents that timer. You give it a block, and it's just going to, every interval that you pass in, it's just going to invoke that block. Uh, something, again, to notice, in that first example there, we're calling sleep, so we're actually blocking the reactor. So you're telling that periodic timer run four times a second, but since you're sleeping for a second, there's no way that can actually fire four times a second. So it's actually only going to fire once a second, and it's actually going to delay other things that need to happen inside the reactor. Uh, the timer objects have a whole bunch of other APIs. You can cancel them and do other stuff that you might need to. So uh, we know about events uh, in the reactor, and there's a, there's a couple quick helper APIs I'm going to go through that basically make managing events easier. So the first one is callback. Um, so, so far we've been using this syntax, but there's actually a bunch of different syntaxes uh, that you could use to pass around sort of event handlers. So you could pass a block through, you could pass actually a proc object in, you could pass a method through, or you could say, I know this object and I know there's a method on it that I need to invoke. And so callback's just a very standardized, standardized interface that allows all these different types of syntaxes. So uh, basically, you can use callback in your code if you're implementing event machine style code to let users pick and choose how they want to specify their event handlers. Uh, so this is an important concept, and <laughs> it's called EM deferrable. It's actually really not well named because people always confuse it with EM defer, and they're completely different concepts. Uh, so deferrables are actually just a way to represent events as objects. So uh, the reason this is powerful is because you can just say, I have this object, and it represents this event. And then anybody who is interested in this event can add procs that will get fired when it either succeeds or fails. Uh, and the reason this is so powerful is because you don't actually have to worry about when the event fires. It's actually quite possible that you're talking about an event that already fired in the past. And deferrable will keep track of when it fired and whether or not it succeeded or failed. And so maybe it already fired five minutes ago, and you just found out about it. And you're like, I want to know when this fires. And you pass in a block. It's just going to say, oh, this already fired, and fire your block right away. Uh, maybe it's the opposite case, and maybe it's going to fire in, in 10 minutes in the future. It just doesn't matter when that event gets triggered. You'll get notification about it. So deferrable is actually a module, which makes it really easy to uh, include in your own classes. Uh, there's the API. You basically can either succeed or def succeed or fail the deferrable object, and then anybody can add callbacks or airbacks, and you can add as many of those as you want. Uh, so a way that you might use this, uh, say you have a HTTP request that returns a deferrable object, and there's three different interested parties that want to do something as soon as there's a successful HTTP request. So here we just pass in three different callbacks. I want to make sure I log this request. I want to save the response to a file, and then finally, I want to fire off the next request. Uh, a couple more helpers. Queue. So we touched on this earlier. Uh, basically, it provides an asynchronous queue. So instead of pop returning a value, it takes a block. And so there's two basic cases, right? Either the queue is empty. Uh, if the queue is empty, it basically stores that block away, and as soon as somebody pushes, it's going to invoke the block. Or if the queue is not empty, it's just going to invoke it right away. Uh, and here again, you'll notice this recursive proc technique. So this basically starts off one sort of worker off of this queue. And the worker just pops one item off. As soon as it's done dealing with that item, it's going to pop off another item. And at the end, you just sort of kick it off by popping off the first item. And that's that one pop at the end is sort of one worker. If you did that five times, then five things would be happening in parallel. Um, and very, simil very similar to Q is a channel. Uh, the only difference here is that instead of one person getting that message, a whole bunch of people can subscribe to it and get that message. And you can unsubscribe and subscribe as well. So the, we covered a bunch of helpers. Uh, I'm going to now dig into actually things that you can actually use event machine for. Uh, so one common thing is dealing with subprocesses. So you can actually run subcommands without blocking. 
So this is cool. You might, uh, maybe you have a daemon running that converts images. You're calling out to image magic, or you're doing something like Ruby processing. Whatever it is, you're invoking an external process, and you don't want to block. You just want to get a notification when that process completes, and if it was successful or not. And so again, very similar sort of technique. Instead of getting a return value, you pass in a block, and that block will get an output, whatever STD out was, and a status. Um, EM system actually builds on top of EMP open, which is uh, a streaming interface. So instead of getting one block, you basically receive data as the program is outputting data, and you can sort of interact with it in real time. So you'll notice here, uh, with, in EMP open, we're passing LS handler. Uh, so we're just going to touch really quickly about on what, what these handlers are. Um, so a handler in event machine land is basically a, either a module or a class, and basically defines a bunch of methods for different events that you're uh, trying to process. And so this is just an alternative to creating and passing out procs all the time. You just define methods instead. And this is a preferred way of doing stuff. So the advantages of this are basically that uh, the handler that you pass in gets instantiated. So in the previous example, the LS handler, one instance of that will get instantiated for each subprocess. And so now that you have an instance per subprocess, you can start using instance variables to keep state uh, and also makes your code a lot cleaner. So we, we go back to this example when I was talking about how event machine code can be hard and asynchronous code in general can be hard. And the, the cool thing is you can rewrite this as a handler and basically you create one method that does one very simple thing and passes along another method as, as sort of the callback. And so the find URL passes along the next method in the chain, which is the HP get method. And so the code just gets a lot more readable, a lot cleaner, and it's a lot easier to refactor and add steps in between. Uh, whereas if you were trying to add a step in the top there, you would have to reformat a lot of code and indent it, and it just gets really messy. So uh, networking. This is what most people want to do with the vent machine, and this is what it's really, really good at, writing network servers and clients. So there's a few basic APIs. Start server, that obviously starts TCP servers. There's connect, which starts up a TCP client. And then there's open datagram socket, which is used for UDP. UDP doesn't have a distinction between server and client. Everything is just a socket. So the way this looks, uh, on the bottom there, we're calling connect. And connect can either take a Unix domain socket or a host and port. And again, you pass it through a handler. Uh, and the top there, we're starting a server. And again, we pass through a handler. and for each client that connects to the server on port 8080, one instance of client handler is going to get instantiated. Uh, so these handlers are usually either modules that get mixed into EM connection or subclasses of EM connection. And EM connection comes with a bunch of events and methods on it. So there's, there's basically two sets of methods. They're all just methods. But there's certain methods that the reactor calls to let you know stuff is happening, which are called events. And there's certain methods that you call to interact with the reactor. So we can go through some of these. These are all defined inside EM connection. Connection completed. Uh, this is useful for clients. Basically, uh, you called EM connect. As soon as that connection actually is successful, the reactor is going to fire the connection completed handler on uh, whatever module you passed in. Similarly, there's receive data for incoming data, unbind for when the connection closes. Methods you can call uh, in connection completed or post init, you could just e call start TLS. And that's one method call. That's all you need to enable SSL. And SSL is completely built in and takes care of everything for you. So it's really easy to make your connections encrypted. Uh, you can get the remote IP and port, send data, close connections. There's a lot more fancy features. Uh, you can easily do proxies. You can pause and resume connections. You can do all sorts of crazy stuff. So let's go back to what we started with. We started with this blocking code that's basically going to wait until it reads a new line off the socket. And that's when it returns you a line that it read. With non-blocking code, uh, you don't have that luxury. You're basically going to get whatever data was available. And you don't know what's available. So uh, the thing you have to do here, and we touched upon this earlier, is you have to create a buffer and parse out logical packets from that buffer. Uh, and sort of the overriding idea behind this, this is that TCP is a stream. So what this means is, say you have either a client or server on one end, and it calls send data, it sends string hello, and then it sends the string world. When this goes over the network, you don't 
have any guarantees about how it's going to show up on the other end because TCP is a stream and you're reading whatever data is available. So on the other end, it might show up like that. And so it's your responsibility as, uh, as a user or as a developer to write code that parses out packets in the way that you expect them to show up. So the code on the top right is a very naive way of writing a handler. This is the way everybody starts out writing a handler and it's, it doesn't work. Uh, so the way you're actually supposed to write this handler, again, is you have to create a buffer. You buffer data, and then based on the protocol you're using, uh, in this case, we're using a line-based protocol, so we're saying anytime there's a new line, we know we've received a logical packet. So we use slice to parse out that packet, and then we go ahead and do whatever processing we want. Um, you can use, there's a bunch of other helpers inside of my machine you could use. There's a thing called buffer tokenizer that you could pass through a new line to, and it'll do this sort of thing for you. Uh, buffer tokenizer is cool because you can say maybe I want to actually uh, separate my packets with null bytes, or maybe I want to give this give this crazy string that I want to separate my packets. But the basic idea is you end up writing these protocol implementations that take this raw stream of data and find uh, logical packets based on the protocol that you're using. So Event Machine actually contains a whole bunch of different protocols inside the protocol na namespace. Uh, one of the really cool ones that I like using a lot and um, I really recommend that you check out when you're trying to write a simple server or client is the object protocol. So the way this works is all you have to do in your handler is just include object protocol. An object protocol is responsible for defining received data for you. And so if you look at what it's doing, it's basically defining a whole bunch of stuff. It's make sure that enough data has showed up. And again, it's doing buffering. And eventually when there's enough data, it just unmarshals a Ruby object off of that stream. And it takes that new Ruby object and invokes receive object. And so basically in your handler, you don't have to worry about any of the little details anymore. Instead of using send data and receive data, you can now just use send object and receive object and just deal directly with Ruby objects. And it's going to handle all the marshalling and unmarshalling for you. There's a lot more protocols. There's a bunch that are built in. There's a bunch that the community has put up on GitHub and on RubyForge. Uh, so some simple ones that are built in, we have a lot of email stuff, uh, memcache, stomp, we have a bunch of other ones. Uh, external, we have a really good HTTP request. There's actually a couple built in HTTP protocols. I don't recommend that you use them. They're going to get deprecated. Uh, the one that's linked on the right there is the one to use and it's really robust and supports a lot of different features. Um, there's also very recently a whole bunch of WebSocket implementations. Uh, which is really cool. Uh, you can use that stuff with Chrome and the new browsers to do some pretty fancy stuff. So uh, that's networking, and we touched upon ePoll and KQ, and so I'm just going to explain this really quick. Uh, we talked about in the very beginning io.select, and Event Machine uses select by default. And select is very portable, it works well, it even works on Windows, but it has some limitations. By default, it's limited to a thousand open file descriptors, so you can only handle a maximum of 1,000 connections. Uh, it also doesn't actually scale very well, so it gets slower as you add connections to that set, and this is because the way it's implemented, uh, you basically, you're passing the list of things you care about into the kernel every time, and the kernel has to copy it in and out of kernel space. Um, so the alternative to this that allows you to scale up to tens of thousands of connections is uh, EPO and KQ, Linux sets EPO, OS X, and BSD have KQ. Uh, and the way it works internally is different. You just register the file descriptors once up front, and then after that you just get events as, as they happen. Uh, and so to use these in my machine, it's really easy. Before you call em.run, you just need to invoke em.epo or em.kq based on whatever platform you're on. There's a lot more stuff you can do with the reactor. I covered uh, some of the major features, but there's a bunch of other stuff. You can actually watch files and processes, so you can get notifications when a file gets deleted or moved or modified. You can get notifications when a process forks off or a process dies. Uh, you can receive input from standard in, all, all sorts of crazy stuff. So I covered a lot of stuff. Uh, you might be curious, how do I actually use this uh, in sort of a real world situation? Like what can I do to actually take advantage of Event Machine? Um, so there's a couple of different ways you can use the machine in your web applications. Uh, you can run EM in a thread, and again, if you're trying to do something like that, I recommend going back through these slides through the threading section, look over that. Um, 
The best way to do it is just to use an EM-enabled web server. Uh, there's a few of those now. Thin is the most popular. There's also Rainbows, which is uh, sort of related to the Unicorn project, but event machine enabled. And as, as long as you're using one of these, they already have an event machine reactor running. And so in your handlers, in your models, in wherever you want, basically, you can just invoke any of the EM APIs that we talked about and set up timers or make HTTP requests or do whatever you want, basically. Uh, if you want to go one step further, there's a really cool project called Async Sinatra that is really cool for handling streaming and delayed responses. Uh, so there's some quick uh, examples. Basically, it just adds to the Sinatra DSL. So instead of get, you can do a get or a post. Uh, so on the left there, if you call slash delay slash one, it's basically not going to return anything to you until one second has elapsed. And you can actually do those ten you know, 5,000 people could hit that URL, and one second later, all 5,000 would get a response, and you're not actually blocking anything. Uh, that technique is really useful for sort of long polling, and there's a more real-world example on the right where you're actually making an HTTP request, and when that response comes back is when you respond to who made the request to you. Uh, so I, will, I want to show off a quick little demo. Uh, I wrote a simple little chat server. It's a line-based protocol. It covers a lot of the things we talked about. So there's a line-based protocol in there. It just uses uh, the same buffering technique that we showed about. It has just one channel. It creates a channel object. And so when new connections come in, they all subscribe to the channel. And that's how messages are distributed. Uh, I want to show off a couple more APIs. So I implemented a slash say command. And that uses a combination of EMQ and system. So basically, if you do slash say and type in some text, that's going to add to a queue on my laptop. And there's a, pro there's a recursive proc that's just sitting, popping off things off that queue and calling EM system in a non-blocking fashion to invoke the say command on, on OS X to actually make the computer talk. Um, I also added uh, a simple. EMHTP request to Twitter streaming API. So if anybody mentions Event Machine or MWRC, those tweets just get pipelined right into the reactor. So again, this you can check out this gist. I'm gonna I, I have to start this up and do some other stuff, but we can try this out in a second. Uh, but again, in just 120 lines of code, there's one reactor loop that's doing all of this stuff, and that's not blocking. It's able to handle a whole bunch of connections. Um, so what I did was, since the internet's so bad, I set up a ad hoc wireless network called uh, MWRC Event Machine. So if you can try connecting to that. <laughs> yes. Um, Sorry, I'm kind of confused with the multiple screens over here. So the server is now up and running. Uh, let me just try to figure out what IP address I'm on. OK, so here's the IP address, uh, 169.254.43.149. I think that's the same IP I have on here, yeah. So what you can do is actually just open up a terminal. Uh, as long as you're on this network, you can tell net to port 1337 on that IP. And it's a nice little chat server. Uh, I'm using terminal emulation to do like colors and crazy stuff like that. Um, so if people are actually able to join, they'll show up in here. And I implemented a couple commands. So you can change your nick, lets everybody else know that you changed your nick. Um, and I can say hello. Yeah, sorry. One second. There you go. One six nine two five four forty three one four nine port one three three seven. Doesn't look like anybody's able to connect. So the internet's actually broken, so the, the Twitter stuff's not going to work. But uh, 
Yeah, people can join, chat, and then basically if I say hello, then my computer's going to start talking. And uh, if you guys are able to join, you can do that and make my computer say stupid things. Um, so that's basically it. The code's all up here. Uh, you can check it out. Uh, it's actually really simple. Uh, I don't know how much time I have. I could go over it real quick. All right, so I'll just, I'll just show you the code. Again, it's not very long. So it's all in all, it's 130 lines of code. At the bottom here, we're starting the reactor. And we just start a server. We say chat client is our handler. Uh, and then at the bottom here, we're connecting to the Twitter stream, watching for these things. And anytime things come in, we just parse them and send them to the, to the chat server. So in here, we have a couple things. We have a channel. And so again, you can see in here, all you have to do to send a message to the chat channel is just push something onto the channel object, and everybody who's subscribed gets it. Um, and there's all sort of, sorts of crazy ANSI codes in here. So uh, there's a channel. There's a queue over here. Again, I create a queue. Um, and then there's just a simple processor that just pops the thing off of the queue, calls system to say that message. And as soon as it's finished saying that message, it goes ahead and pops another thing off the queue. So there's this two of those things. And then there's a post in it, which gets fired as soon as somebody connects. And so I send them, I give them a name, I subscribe to the channel, and I just send a header along and send some scrolling and other ANSI codes. And then I let everybody know that this person joined. And then unbind is when they get disconnected. So I unsubscribe them from the channel and let everybody else know that they left. Uh, and then all you, the only other thing you need to do is set up your received data. Again, I do some buffering in here, and I pull out complete lines, and I just have to do a simple case statement, or I guess in here I'm just doing regex if statements. So you can change your NIC. It basically uh, changes your name, lets everybody know you change your name. You can say something that just pushes onto that queue, and there's a processor sitting on that queue, invoking commands in the background. You can quit, uh, and then else, whatever you said, basically gets sent to everybody else with your name attached to it. So I don't know if anybody was actually able to join, but. Yeah, it, it, uh, it doesn't appear to be working. All right, well, I tried. <laughs> but you, could, you, could just, uh, you could download this and run it on your own box and tell it to it locally to try it out if you were interested. So uh, where's play? That's pretty much it. Uh, there's a bunch of information. We have all the codes on GitHub. We hang out on IRC. These slides are up on Time to Bleed. Um, we actually just moved the home page over to, over to GitHub, and we're trying to clean that up. So if, if that's something you're interested in helping out with, or if you want to help out with the next release or with documentation, that's definitely something we could use some help with. Uh, other than that, you can find me either on IRC or Twitter or GitHub. Any questions? Yeah. So you said there's a Java version. Yep, there is a JRuby reactor. It works really well. I actually uh, refactored a lot of it and uh, ported a lot of the design concepts from the C++ reactor a few months ago. And I have used it in production. So does the JVM use Evo and uh, The JVM does. If you're using the latest JVM, uh, it will automatically use KQ or EPOL based on the system you're on. So is the performance comparable? Yes. Yeah, and it does all the same sort of stuff just in Java code, just to make sure everything is non-blocking and does I.O. as fast as possible. And is the Java library available for use in the actual Java library? Uh, yeah, it's, it's part of our code base. You could actually just use the jar yourself. Um, it's sort of tied to Ruby. I think it maybe tries to invoke some of the Ruby APIs directly, but you could probably easily modify it to use it as its own little thing. Over here. It seemed like you said that uh, you have to actually tell it to use KQ. Yes, you do have to explicitly tell it. Uh, select actually works really well for most cases. So unless you're actually expecting to handle a lot of traffic, uh, there's no real need to enable KQ or EPOL. Uh, the real reason it's optional is because uh, there was a big issue with threading and EPOL, and we only recently fixed that. And so in the future, we could actually automatically detect and enable that by default. But that's not something we've done yet. Uh, any other questions? Uh, up there. So um, a lot of like, you talk a lot about like, views. 
for performance? Like, how does how performant is this as opposed to Python Explicit or Node.js? Uh, it's very comparable. They all use similar sort of techniques. Actually, in benchmarks, uh, it's actually really hard to benchmark this kind of stuff. But in sort of uh, rudimentary benchmarks, it does outperform both libEV and libEV is what um, Node uses and uh, Python's reactor. Uh, and the big reason for that is because a lot of the stuff is done either in Java or C++ directly. And it does uh, a lot of stuff that even libEV doesn't do, like a lot of the buffering it takes care of. And so as, as a user, you don't actually, when you call send data, all it's doing is putting that into a buffer. And the reactor actually very intelligently will try to push out that data as fast as possible. And, and even, even if you have like a lot of connections. Yeah, you can handle con connections when you're doing non-blocking I.O. are very, very cheap. Uh, they're just you know a few bytes inside the kernel. and. Um, especially with something like EPOLO KQ, I have done in production with one Ruby process handled 8,000 uh, clients without without breaking a sweat. I've got uh, that machine is loaded on uh, older AMD hardware can serve uh, 25,000 plus. Uh, file, you know, web servers would be 25,000 plus files a second. So to say something bold, can you say that if you got Ruby and you got any machines, there's no point in Node.js or something like that? Sure. I mean, Node.js actually borrows a lot of concepts, and we've, we're uh, borrowing some of the concepts that they've innovated on. And it's, it's a sim similar sort of technique, and it's basically the same thing. It's just, do you want to write Ruby code or do you want to write JavaScript? Uh, the, the advantage in JavaScript land is people are already used to writing asynchronous code and handling events in the way that I described. Whereas in the Ruby land, people are more used to writing synchronous code. And so it's sort of a, um, people tend to write code the wrong way. And that's something I try to highlight in this talk is, you know, don't call sleep because that's not going to work. Whereas in JavaScript, you can't call sleep, so it's not a problem. So it's just a little bit easier. Uh, back there. That's good already, but um, is it possible to write files uh, that's something that we do not support. That's something that I want to copy from Node. Uh, it's actually implemented really well there. The problem is that Select, EPO, and KQ don't work on disk I.O. They only work on network I.O. And so the way that Node does disk I.O. is actually they have a thread pool of real kernel threads in the background that disk I.O. gets passed back to. Uh, and there's a library called libEIO that Node uses, uh, and it works really well. And that's something we've definitely uh, talked about bringing to Event Machine. Anybody else? All right, thank you.